Welcome to this video on preterm labor. For this presentation on preterm labor, there are four learning objectives. The first is to learn the definition of preterm labor. The second is to learn risk factors for preterm labor and also to appreciate the complications associated with preterm labor. The third is to learn how to clinically evaluate for preterm labor including the negative predictive value of actin partus. The fourth is to learn how to clinically manage preterm labor. This includes administration of corticosteroids, tocolytics, antibiotic prophylaxis for group B streptococcus and treatment of risk factors. Preterm labor is defined by regular organized contractions occurring before 37 weeks of gestation and accompanied by cervical change including dilation, effacement or both. Both contractions and cervical change must be present in order to have a diagnosis of preterm labor. If a woman just has contractions with no cervical change over several hours, this is not considered preterm labor but rather preterm contractions. The clinical management for preterm labor versus preterm contractions is quite different. For preterm contractions, the management is supportive care, whereas with preterm labor, active management is required. We will discuss the management of preterm labor in more detail later in this presentation. There are several risk factors for preterm labor. These include multiple gestations such as twins, history of previous preterm birth, a short cervical length during pregnancy, past gynecological conditions or surgeries such as uniconuate uterus, and current pregnancy complications such as depression or infections. Bacterial vaginosis is associated with preterm labor. The relative contribution of this condition remains controversial, especially in women with no other risk factors. Preterm labor is associated with multiple neonatal complications that pose serious challenges for neonatal intensive care units. These can be divided into short-term and long-term complications or via the respective systems such as respiratory and cardiovascular abnormalities. For short-term complications, these include hypothermia, respiratory distress syndrome, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, patent ductus arteriosus, necrotizing enterocolitis, intraventricular hemorrhage, neonatal sepsis, and retinopathy of prematurity. Long-term complications include poor growth, chronic lung diseases, and neurodevelopmental impairments such as impaired cognitive skills, vision and hearing difficulties, cerebral palsy, behavioral and psychological problems. Extremely pretermed birth is defined as birth between 22 and 25 weeks. Most neonatal intensive care units provide intensive care routinely at 24 weeks. The younger the gestational age of the fetus, the more severe the disabilities present. However, even late preterm births between 34 to 36 weeks of gestation is associated with increased risk of complications, specifically respiratory conditions such as respiratory distress syndrome, pneumonia, and respiratory failure. Imagine that you're in the labor and delivery unit of your hospital and a woman presents to you at 33 weeks of gestation complaining of crampy contraction pains. You immediately think of preterm labor versus preterm contractions. How will you go about evaluating the patient further? First, you must start with the history. A basic obstetric history including the risk factors for preterm birth and estimated gestational age is required. Subsequently, evaluate the preterm labor symptoms. Ask about the nature of the contractions, namely the duration, intensity, and the frequency of contractions.
Remember, labor contractions become increasingly painful over time and occur with a rhythmic regularity at least every five minutes, if not more frequently than that. Lastly, ask about any spotting of blood or bloody mucus on her undergarments, otherwise known as bloody show, which is related to cervical softening and defacement. Then, you move on to the physical exam. First, conduct an abdominal examination, including evaluating the uterus to assess firmness, tenderness, fetal size, and fetal position. Next, conduct a speculum examination with a wet, non-lubricated speculum. You inspect the cervix, looking for dilation, lesions, bleeding, and fetal membrane status. On top of diagnosing preterm labor, this evaluates for concomitant conditions such as placental abruption or preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes. If the patient is at more than 22 weeks gestation and has not had intercourse, cervical exam, tampon, or vaginal ultrasound in the last 24 hours, you would do an actin partus test. This detects the presence of phosphorylated insulin-like growth factor binding protein 1, synthesized by maternal decidual cells in cervical secretions. If vaginal infection is suspected, wet prep, as well as cervical and urine culture can be conducted to rule out the respective conditions. You would then move on to the digital cervix exam after placenta previa and rupture of membranes has been excluded. This is to measure the dilation of the internal cervical os as well as degree of cervical effacement. In your evaluation, be constantly aware of the output from the electronic fetal monitor and the maternal tachometer. These allow you to objectively document fetal heart rate patterns and the frequency of maternal contractions. If your patient is contracting regularly and the fetal heart rate pattern is reassuring, recheck the patient's cervix in a couple of hours to see if it has become more dilated or effaced. If it has and the contractions persist, your patient is indeed in preterm labor. If diagnosis is unclear, a transvaginal and obstetric ultrasound examination can be used for further evaluation. Let's return to talk about the actin partus test. Let's say you have a patient at 33 weeks who presents complaining of contractions. If the actin partus test is negative, there is a 92% to 98% chance that the patient will not go into preterm labor in the next 1 to 2 weeks. Or in other words, a negative actin partus test is reassuring in that your patient probably won't go into preterm labor. However, the positive predictive value of actin partus is less than 22 to 86%. So from that perspective, a positive actin partus test really doesn't tell you with much certainty if your patient really is in or will go into preterm labor. The important point to remember is that the value of actin partus is in its negative predictive value. Furthermore, the test will not be useful clinically if the specimen is contaminated with blood, semen, gel, or if there is a history of any foreign object in the vagina within the last 24 hours. Finally, actin partus is only performed after more than 22 weeks of gestational age. Now, let's turn to the management of preterm labor. All patients diagnosed with preterm labor with less than 34 weeks of gestation are hospitalized and with initiation of treatment. There are four basic things to keep in mind. Number one is corticosteroids such as betamethasone and dexamethasone given if gestational age is between 24 to 34 weeks. A single rescue course of antenatal steroids is given to those at high risk of preterm delivery within the next 7 days. This is the most beneficial intervention in preterm labor because it reduces the incidence and severity of respiratory distress syndrome, intraventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis. Number 2 is tocolytics, 
which are agents that aim to stop uterine smooth muscle contractions. The primary purpose of giving a tocolytic in the setting of preterm labour is to abate the contractions enough to allow the administration of the full steroids cause and the circulatory transport of the steroids to the fetus. Ideally, tocolysis can prolong the pregnancy for up to 2 to 7 days in order for steroids to achieve its maximum fetal effect. There are several tocolytics available but none are truly ideal in terms of clinical efficacy or side effect profile. The agents include magnesium sulfate, nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, indomethacine, which is a prostaglandin inhibitor, and terbutaline, which is a beta mimetic. Of note, multiple tocolytics for the purpose of prolonging pregnancy are not proven to be beneficial. Number three is neuroprotection via administration of magnesium sulfate for pregnancies less than 32 weeks of gestation. In utero exposure to magnesium sulfate provides neuroprotection against cerebral palsy and other types of severe motor dysfunction in offspring born preterm. Finally, number four is prophylaxis against early onset neonatal group B streptococcus infection. If your patient is in preterm labor and her group B streptococcus status is unknown, you would obtain cultures using a vaginal rectal swab and then start IV penicillin. If the cultures for GBS come back negative, or if the patient has recent negative cultures on record, then there is no need for antibiotic prophylaxis and they can be stopped. If contractions abate spontaneously or with tocolytics, or the cervix does not change any further, the patient is no longer in active preterm labor and antibiotics for GBS prophylaxis can be discontinued. Apart from these four main treatment principles, treatment of risk factors for preterm labor is also indicated, such as any urinary tract infection, sexually transmitted infections, or bacterial vaginosis. Quiz time! Question 1. Which of the following is not a risk factor for preterm labor? Question 2. Which of the following is a long-term complication associated with preterm birth? Question 3. Which of the following is not part of the management of preterm labour? 